Hi, I'm Angela Wallach, Design Director with Durable Digital, um, and I'm here today to talk about accessibility. Um, my talk is called Demystifying Accessibility. Um, what is it like to use the web with a disability? It can range from irritating to impossible to even being physically harmful. Consider Lucy, who is blind, as she discusses her experience shopping online using a screen reader. You're clicking on something that says graphic, 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 or some numbered file name, or some gibberish like that. Or Clark, who's colorblind, who says, green and red look the same to me, so it's frustrating when designers use them to mean the exact opposite of each other. Or Ricky, who's deaf. I can look up a video about concealers, and somehow the automatic closed captioning will be talking about zebras. And Justin, who has a vestibular disorder, which can cause dizziness, these animations are literally making me nauseous and giving me a headache. Why? Everybody who works on the web has the power to, in some way, make the internet more accessible for people who struggle with it. But why, collectively, are we not doing a better job with this? Let's consider some typical attitudes towards web accessibility from people who are responsible for making and maintaining websites. Stephen, a compliance officer, says, our primary objective is to avoid getting sued. And while the legal perspective is important, focusing on risk aversion, it really misses the ways that accessibility can benefit the user experience. Or Jill, who's an account manager at a digital agency. We make accessible sites for our government assignments, or if a client specifically requires it. And the problem here is, Thinking about accessibility as an optional add-on or something that's only relevant to certain types of websites rather than a universal best practice. And Chris, a QA developer, we've tested our site using a screen reader, so we know it's accessible. And often people think first about visual impairment when they think about web accessibility, but there are many different types of disabilities that can impact your audience auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, speech, and visual. And finally, Lee, a content strategist. It doesn't really affect me. Aside from writing alt text, accessibility is really something that's handled by our developers. And this gets to one of the main themes of the talk, and that is that accessibility is everyone's job, um, and that it requires ongoing effort. It's not a one-time thing that you build the site and you're done with it and you never have to think about it again. So in this talk, I want to provide you with some strategies to help create a better experience for disabled people and ultimately everyone else too. So first, let's define what we mean by web accessibility. Um, very simply, it's websites that are designed, written, and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. And by doing so, this enables everyone to participate and contribute on the web. Um, you know, if you think about it, Access to the internet is perhaps even more important for people with disabilities. Um, think of the ways that an everyday activity like going to the supermarket could be a challenge for someone with limited mobility or is blind. Being able to shop online should remove barriers, not create new ones. Um, a 2016 Pew Research survey found that only 40% of disabled Americans feel comfortable using the internet, compared to 80% of non-disabled users. So how do we know if a site is accessible? Um, really, the main standard for this is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or the WCAG. Uh, this is a document published by the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, and it spells out three different levels of conformance. Um, level A is kind of the minimum requirement. Double A is um, typically what's required if, it, if you do have a legal requirement to meet or government sites require that. And then triple A is really kind of the gold standard. So the guidelines themselves comprise over 90 criteria. And they're organized in four different categories, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, so I guess I just want to walk through a couple examples from each of the categories to give you a sense of the kinds of things that are in the guidelines. Um, so the first one that many people are already familiar with is providing alternative text for images. Um, or alt text. This is um, you know, describing the content of an image so that somebody using a screen reader can perceive the, the content of that image. Um, 
And then logically sequenced content. This is about making sure that the underlying structure of the page and the order of the page is logical. Um, so people that are using an assistive technology that reads the content out loud, that they're having a good experience and that that makes sense as it goes through the flow of the page. For operable, a good example of this is providing controls for moving content. So if you have something like a carousel, for example, um, you want to have a pause button, a way to advance to the next slide, go back to the previous slide, that kind of thing. Because moving content can be a barrier to anyone who has trouble reading text quickly, um, somebody who has trouble tracking moving objects, and it can also just be very distracting for someone who has an attention deficit disorder. Um, another example of operable is multiple ways to navigate. Um, so a lot of times when we think about navigation, we think of the kind of, uh, you know, the menu bar at the top of the page. But we should also be considering, you know, the importance of search or having a table of contents or an HTML sitemap. Because users with visual impairments may find it easier just to search for the specific content they're looking for than kind of wade through a complex navigation menu. Um, and somebody with a cognitive disability may prefer to see kind of the, the whole layout of the site and how things are organized rather than going from page to page. Um, and for understandable, uh, a lot of the understandable criteria are about content. So things like writing in clear, simple language. This is important for people with cognitive disabilities, but honestly, everybody prefers to read clear, simple language. Um, another example is providing appropriate error messages. So this is a, um, you know, a written message in text, which you can do, you can supplement it with things like color and icons, but just highlighting a field in red is not considered sufficient to identify an error. Um, if somebody's colorblind or using a screen reader, they won't be able to pick up that visual cue necessarily. Um, and even something like an icon, somebody with a cognitive disability may not understand the meaning of that icon. And finally, robust. Um, a lot of this pertains to sort of the technical side of how the site is built. So it includes things like valid markup, correctly labeled names and roles of interface components. And these kinds of things help that um, ensure that assistive technology, such as screen readers, screen magnifiers, and speech recognition software, can actually parse the content accurately, um, do it without crashing, and ensures the functionality of interactive elements. So over the next few days, as you kind of browse the internet looking at sites, including your own, I would encourage you to start looking at them through an accessibility lens. Um, there are a lot of great tools and browser plugins. Um, I can share a list of resources at the end that include some of those tools. But I want to discuss just three like really basic things that you can do in your web browser without having to install anything. I'm not intending to provide you know, a comprehensive accessibility audit by any means. But what I like about these tests is that I think they help build empathy because you will kind of experience the frustration um, that somebody who needs these things would face. So the first one is about keyboard navigation. So keyboard accessibility is really important both for screen reader users and people with motor impairments, uh, which could be things like a tremor, an illness that causes pain or fatigue, uh, or somebody with limited capacity for body movement. And so you should be able to you know, accomplish any task on the website just using the keyboard. And if you want to try this yourself, you know, just simply open up a page and start to use the tab key to navigate between links and interactive elements. Um, and one thing that you might encounter, I see this too often on sites like e-commerce sites where a pop-up layer comes up and then the focus, the keyboard focus, stays on the layer that's underneath this pop-up. Um, so if the focus doesn't get shifted to that new layer, you know, you're unable to fill in the form, you're unable to close it, and you also can't see the content behind it. So it makes the site essentially unusable for somebody using the keyboard only. So another really important aspect to keyboard navigation is providing a clear, visible focus state and ensuring that the order as you're tabbing through a page is a logical order. Um, so I'm going to pick on the Wall Street Journal for just a minute here. Um, say that I want to read this lead story about Hurricane Dorian. So as I start to use the tab key to move through the page, I don't see anything visually happening on the page. And I've just highlighted here um, in the slides 
what I'm looking at is the, the URL of the link in the bottom of the screen that you'll see in many browsers. And so as I'm hitting tab, I'm seeing these URLs change. They're taking me out to other sites that I wouldn't necessarily expect to be seeing. But I'm not seeing anything on the page that's indicating where I am or, you know, am I close to getting to the content that I want to read. And finally, after tabbing 61 times, I see my first visible focus state, which is this blue outline around the headline. And so then I know, okay, I can hit enter, and that's going to take me to the content that I want. Um, so that's not a very good experience. A better experience is to provide a skip navigation link. So if you go to a site like Amazon, and many other sites do this, the first thing that you'll see as you hit tab is a link to skip to the main content so you can bypass all of that navigation and just get to the main uh, body of the page. So the second test that I want to show you is to go into your browser settings and change your font size and your page zoom. And these kinds of things are very important for people with a vision impairment. Um, and if you change these settings in your browser, you would expect that sites should respect that and adapt accordingly. So here I've highlighted in Chrome um, the font size, which you can go up to very large, and page zoom you can go up to 200%. Um, but unfortunately, not every site respects these preferences. So if I go to Google, for example, and this is kind of a default view, and then when I have my font set to very large in my browser settings, you can see that the type didn't actually get any larger. Um, and when I set the zoom to 200%, it does zoom in, but it introduces horizontal scrolling. So it's kind of trading in for another bad experience. A better example would be the New York Times, where if this is the default view, I set my font size to very large, everything scales up, but it kind of retains the layout, the overall look and feel, and it's a pretty good experience. Um, and then if I set the zoom to 200%, it switches me over to the mobile view. So I have a one column layout, no horizontal scrolling, and it's still a pretty good experience. And then the third thing that's really easy to check for as you're browsing the internet is to see, when you see video and audio files, um, check for things like captions and transcripts. Are they present? Um, captions um, obviously are important for people with hearing impairment, but transcripts have a few different audiences um, that may be necessary for. Um, individuals who are deaf and blind, a transcript is probably going to be the best way for them to consume video content. Um, and also people with cognitive or reading impairments that make it hard for them to follow um, synchronized captions may prefer a transcript. And then the last point on screen here, audio descriptions. If you're not familiar with audio descriptions, what they are is an audio narration of what the visual content is on screen so that somebody who's blind can understand um, you know, the context of what other people are looking at. So a case where this is particularly important is you know, if you have a speaker in a video and you introduce who they are with like a text panel, um, and maybe you have their name and title, but that information is never said aloud, somebody who's only listening to the content, you know, they would be missing this critical information. So the audio description provides that um, as an additional kind of audio track. So we've had like just a small taste of how frustrating it can be if a site doesn't support some basic accessibility features. Um, and I suspect that you're watching this because you're already interested in accessibility. But how do you get this going within your organization? How do you convince your team that it's worth it? Um, I want to give you a few arguments that hopefully you can use to convince people. So I mentioned the legal perspective at the beginning of this talk. And it's true that for many organizations, accessibility is a legal requirement. Uh, lawsuits in US federal court tripled last year um, related to web accessibility. That's tripled over the year before. Um, and it's not just for government sites. The ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, that applies to websites of businesses that are over a certain size or fall into the category of public accommodation. So that can be things like hotels, banks, um, transportation, et cetera. And you know, there's similar laws. I'm mostly familiar with the requirements in the US because that's where I'm based. But around the world, um, there's the Accessible Canada Act, the EU Directive on Web Accessibility. Um, I know the UK has similar laws. Um, and the one thing that I will say about the legal aspect of this is that that is not typically going to be 
sort of the most compelling argument or the, the biggest motivator for your designers and your developers. But it can be really important for getting that executive buy-in. A company's digital presence should reflect its brand values. Uh, Boston Consulting Group reports that 98% of large companies, over 1,000 employees, have diversity and inclusion programs. But unfortunately, the challenges that people with disabilities face are often overlooked in this context. But if people with disabilities cannot use your website, that certainly has the potential to damage your brand. Um, and it's not just businesses. Earlier this year, there were articles um, published about how none of the US presidential candidates actually had accessible websites, um, which certainly can do reputational damage. Also, it's too large of an audience to ignore. 15% um, of people worldwide live with some form of disability, according to the World Health Organization. And this is a pretty significant figure. Um, imagine if your web traffic suddenly increased by 15%, or better yet, conversions increased by 15%. That would more than pay for whatever resources you're going to put into maintaining accessibility. Research by DQ Systems, published earlier this year, found that Two-thirds of blind individuals' online transactions were abandoned due to their inability to access parts of a website. And they also estimate that companies without accessible websites are losing $6.9 billion a year of business to companies that do have accessible sites. And machines like content develop for accessibility. Um, if you're concerned about SEO, well-structured semantic HTML, logical link structures, these are the kinds of things that ensure that Google can understand what's happening on your site. Um, alt text and captions on videos, that exposes visual content to search engines. So it's really important for that reason also. Um, and coming from a UX background, for me this argument in particular is very compelling, that designing for edge cases ultimately helps everyone. So the image on screen here is kind of a classic example that people use when they talk about accessible design. Um, it's a curb cut, which was originally created for users of wheelchairs, um, but it's something that ultimately benefits everyone. If you've ever walked down the street with luggage or a stroller, um, certainly you appreciate this. And I think one thing that's interesting is that now a curb cut is just accepted as normal. It's not considered an accommodation. Um, and in the digital space, there's similar things. Um, email, touchscreen devices, and audiobooks actually all originated as assistive technology and are you know, widespread now. So I want to go through some of the ways that meeting the WCAG requirements will benefit a wide variety of people, um, including those without disabilities. So sufficient color contrast, um, that helps users who have a vision impairment, of course, but perhaps somebody just forgot their reading glasses for the day and they need a little additional help. Or if you're outdoors in bright sunlight, um, you don't need to have a vision impairment. If there's glare on your screen and it's hard to see, you appreciate that the designer didn't put you know, white type on yellow background. And video captions um, were designed to help people with hearing impairment. Um, but you know, they're also important if you want to watch videos in public space and you don't have headphones. Or for language learners, it can be really helpful to you know, be hearing the content and then also seeing it written below. That can be really useful for language learners. And keyboard navigation. Uh, we talked about how that's important for people with a physical or visual impairment. Um, but you know, think about maybe somebody with a temporary injury. If you've sprained your wrist and for a couple weeks it's hard to use a mouse. Or somebody who's an efficient power user. If there's a site that you go back to over and over and over again, and you know maybe there's a form on it, over time, you probably would appreciate just being able to kind of tab through that instead of having to click into each field um, separately. So kind of with all of these reasons together, I believe that accessibility is just a professional best practice. Um, it's an indicator of quality. It's an indicator of adhering to best practices. And you, know, you want to create the best possible experience for your users, and this is part of that. And I mean, it's unfortunate that this is true, but right now, if you're building accessible websites by default, that is a competitive differentiator, because unfortunately, it's just not that common yet. So hopefully, you're on board, and you've got your team on board with the value of making your site accessible. 
Um, so let's turn our attention to some of the hurdles that you can expect to encounter on your journey and how to address them. So first, the challenge. The major blocker that's keeping organizations from achieving and maintaining an accessible website is that it requires really effective collaboration and communication between different departments. Um, so design, development, and content are all equally necessary um, for accessibility to work. If we consider an example scenario, um, let's say that your organization wants to launch a new podcast series. And you, you want to to promote that, you'll have a customized audio player on your site. So from the design point of view, first of all, you need to include accessibility features in the design and user stories. Um, and those can be things like making it clear that a transcript is available, um, being able to change the playback speed, and providing navigation to different parts of the recording. Um, and then as we talked about, things like sufficient color contrast and visible focus states. From a development point of view, the code needs to be valid and semantic with correctly labeled UI controls and logical keyboard navigation with no keyboard traps. And then from the content point of view, you know, we can design and build the functionality to have a transcript be dis displayed, but if that transcript is never created, then you know, of course it's not going to be an accessible experience. Um, and so this can be something that in, for many organizations this might be like a new requirement that the content team might need training on um, to you know, learn the best practices for. So that's just another thing to plan for. Um, and also consider accessibility within the content itself. So if it's an audio recording in this case, you know, things like minimizing the background noise so it's as clear and audible as possible. So I just want to highlight specifically some of the challenges challenges that arise from this distributed responsibility. Um, you know, accessibility is something that has to be considered at every step. It's not like a final thing, um, you know, a final QA step. It's got to be baked into from when the requirements are first identified. And I think it's easy for requirements to be missed because product owners and, you know, members of the team can mistakenly think that accessibility is sort of being handled by somebody else or another team because they don't understand the full, the full breadth of it and what's involved. And as I'm sure you probably already know, collaboration across departments can be difficult. Um, how do you ensure that this overall experience is accessible when you have teams reporting to different departments that don't answer to each other? Um, the classic example of IT versus marketing, for example, that can be a real challenge. And managing that agency to client handoff um, on a new site for a build. Um, you know, if you're building a very flexible solution, and I'm sure that you are, uh, and you're not having a conversation with your client about how to maintain accessibility over time and what's required, you know, it's not reasonable to think that a year later as, you know, new content is added, maybe new functionality is added, that that initial state of accessibility will, will have been maintained over time. Um, so that's a really important conversation to have. So I want to talk through um, some of the factors that will help you be successful in this effort. First of all, get support at the highest possible level. Um, if the executive team, the C-suite, if they're behind your accessibility efforts, that is going to greatly smooth the path towards this cross-discipline collaboration. Um, First of all, it helps everybody to understand that accessibility is really a strategic priority with some staying power. Um, it's not just some new thing that the UX team cooked up. Uh, and it makes it possible to say across the organization, like, yes, this is going to change how we work, and it'll be resourced appropriately. And then hand in hand with that is identifying a sponsor. So a sponsor is someone in senior leadership who will advocate for accessibility across the organization. And their role is really to function as a conduit of information. So they're able to explain to staff how the changes to their work connect to the overall strategy, and then also communicate back up the progress and challenges to the executive team. And again, help secure additional resources if necessary for things like training, et cetera. Um, and create a responsibility matrix. Um, there are dozens of criteria uh, in the WCAG, and so if you want to make sure that you're meeting all of these different criteria, you really need to 
get pretty granular and identify who will be responsible for which items. And you know, doing this up front is going to help build consensus and avoid conflict later on. Um, it can identify where people might need to get training. And depending on the size of your organization, you can set this up by team or by individual. And there's a really good starting point that already exists, um, published by the W3C. It's called the Accessibility Responsibility Breakdown. And what, the, what this document does is it connects each of the criteria in the WCAG back to roles, like typical roles in a digital agency. Um, so here you're seeing um, examples of roles such as information architect or interaction design and the specific criteria that they think relate to that role. And you can also view it by criteria. And so one thing that you might notice here right away is that for a single criteria, that could map to you know, multiple roles. So if you want to get more granular when you create your own um, responsibility chart, um, think about maybe using the RACI model, uh, R-A-C-I, um, that stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed. And so that way you can identify who's ultimately responsible for a specific item versus people that just need to kind of be aware of what's going on. And so as a result of all this, your processes are going to change in a lot of small ways, uh, whether it's adding steps to your QA workflows, um, managing the creation of captions and transcripts, or thinking about your visual design approval process a little bit differently. And so you need to think about how to manage that change. Um, you know, it's really a mixture of communication and training and support that need to go throughout this whole transition period so that people are aware of, you know, how their role might be changing, um, if they have additional responsibilities, you know, and engage with people early on so that you can identify where the stumbling blocks will be and address them, you know, proactively. And, you know, by keeping people in the loop throughout and, you know, that, they're, that people are feeling heard, that's going to reduce a lot of resistance later on. and People will become advocates for the change um, instead of fighting against it. Um, and build knowledge. Uh, I certainly don't think that anybody would necessarily go read the WCAG and, you know, after reading through it once, you're a total expert on all things accessibility. Um, seek out, you know, workshops. Um, a lot of cities have things like meetups that are specifically focused on web accessibility. Um, I'm going to provide a link, as I said, with some online resources that I think are pretty good um, starting points. And it really importantly, try to establish relationships with people who have disabilities, um, who you, you can then hire to involve in your user testing process, or better yet, um, bring them on board as you're designing and building new functionality so that perspective is kind of baked into the initial requirements and not something that's just kind of tacked on or, you know, you have to remediate something after it's already built. Um, and then this idea of accessibility champions. Um, what I mean by this is having somebody embedded in each of your various digital teams. So you might have one person in visual design, one in front end, etc. And these people are, you know, they're interested in deepening their knowledge about accessibility and then sharing it out with the larger group. And what I like about this approach is, say that you can't get that executive support and you don't kind of have the, the top-down support. Um, you know, I think that nobody's going to stop you from identifying people who are going to keep accessibility in mind as you're working on projects. Um, and by doing so, you get to this place of having that more of that holistic thinking. So, you know, if there's somebody on each team who's kind of thinking about accessibility, you're less likely to miss requirements and that kind of thing. And the, the role of these um, accessibility champions, too, is to become a resource to the rest of the team. So if people you know, start to have questions about, you know, what approach should I take? How do I handle this accessibility issue? They know where to turn. So maybe you have you know, an accessibility Slack channel or that sort of thing. And then what I like about this approach, too, is that um, it really requires enthusiasm and interest more than you know, you don't need to have years and years of um, seniority to be an accessibility champion. So this could be like a really great opportunity for junior staff to, you know, take on something a little bit outside their everyday role um, and provide network networking and leadership opportunities. 
So how to get started? There's really two different approaches, um, depending on whether you're planning a new site or um, mitigating issues on your current site. So I'm just going to talk through some of the issues um, for each of those pathways, starting with planning a new site. If you're writing an RFP, um, you're going to work with an outside partner. Um, be sure to make accessibility a requirement. And then hand in hand with that, you know, know what's involved. Because if you understand kind of the full breadth of you know, what makes a site accessible, you'll be in a better position to evaluate the responses that you get. And don't forget training and knowledge sharing. Um, you know, make sure that your partner is able to provide um, any additional training that you may need to maintain accessibility over time. And in terms of cost, I mean, if you're building a new site, the cost of building accessibility in from the beginning is really pretty minor because you're going to get a lot of stuff for free, um, particularly all of the design-related features, things like choosing the right color palette, having multiple ways to navigate. These kinds of things, they don't add any cost to your build. Um, and also, when you set up your development processes, you know, your continuous integration, you can include things like an accessibility testing API. So that's something that can be checked you know, with every, every deployment. And finally, the training piece. Um, if you're already training people on how to use a new solution, you know, it's easier just to kind of add in some additional info about accessibility rather than having to have a whole separate training. And um, I just want to talk about some of the things. We, we would need a whole other session to talk about all the ways to make a you know, Sitecore solution accessible. I just want to highlight a few thoughts to keep in mind um, that really pertain to that idea of content editors being able to maintain accessibility over time. Um, first of all, with video players, um, I talked about audio descriptions a little bit. Um, audio descriptions are actually required for the WCAG um, AA compliance. So if that's something that your organization needs to have, be aware that YouTube embeds do not support audio descriptions. Um, so you may want to look into other players. Uh, there's an open source player called the ABLE player that supports audio descriptions um, and a bunch of other accessibility features. Um, or if you do need to use YouTube, um, be aware that you may have to create two different versions of the video to support audio descriptions. Um, semantic headings, again, we talked about keeping that order of the page logical for screen readers. But I just wanted to mention it here in the context of if you're creating a component that's super flexible that you're going to use in a lot of different contexts around the site and it has a heading in it, um, be sure to let the content editor set what level that heading should be at so that it fits correctly into the structure of the page. Long descriptions. Um, if your site includes a lot of charts or graphs, it's not considered best practice to um, try to cram that entire description of the chart into the alt text. Um, a better option is to link to a long description. And in that long description, you might also want to consider providing the actual data that makes up the chart in tabular form. Um, and you might want to consider this uh, either as a modification to your image component or perhaps create a separate component for handling charts. And then finally, workflows and approvals. Um, when you're designing the workflow for the site, consider how you're going to handle accessibility checks, whether it's you know, a manual check or a combination of a manual check and something supplemented by an automated tool. So, the other approach, if you're mitigating issues on your current site, it can be a bit more challenging. Um, the first thing that you're going to need to do is conduct an audit. And, you know, it's certainly possible to try doing this internally using automated tools. But if you're new to accessibility, I strongly recommend to partner with a specialist um, to help you with this first audit. Um, because they're going to be much more familiar with tools like screen readers and They'll be able to provide advice and guidance um, to help you understand the results that you get back. Um, and it's typically not very expensive, so I, I highly recommend that. And then once you get the results of this audit, um, you're probably going to have a few different items to consider, and you'll need to roadmap a path forward. And you know, you'll need to evaluate for each of the, the things that you need to fix. Evaluate the return on investment based on the location, frequency, and severity of the errors. Um, so location, if something is on the home page versus a five-year-old press release, you know, tackle the issue on the home page first. Likewise, if it's on every single page, for example, in your header or footer, that's pretty important. 
Um, and also consider the WCAG priority level. So a single A error is going to be a higher priority to fix than a double A error. Um, and of course, ease of fixing. Uh, you know, get the low-hanging fruit. If there's something that's easy for you to fix, you know, why not? And then finally, understanding your specific audience needs. Um, if you know that your audience has a high rate of vision impairment, you know, it makes sense to focus on those issues first. And so before we close, I just want to touch on some of the exciting conversations that are happening um, regarding you know, machine learning and AI and how these things can start to benefit the web experience for people with disabilities. Um, first of all, I think we can expect to see better testing tools. Um, right now, many of the tools need to be supplemented by quite a lot of manual testing. Um, so this idea of high-level indication and prediction um, Sort of to compare this to um, a human tester, as you test sites over and over again, you start to see issues where, okay, if I see this issue, I'm pretty sure I'm likely to see these other issues as well. And so you start to form, you know, in your mind, you know that these relationships exist. But if you think about taking a larger data set, um, you know, AI tools can find these relationships, you know, at a much larger scale and things that, you know, aren't even visible to a human tester, like stuff that's in the code and you know, potentially be able to provide a report that would predict the likelihood of certain issues appearing on the site. Um, and likewise, um, for some of the things that require manual testing today, such as, um, for example, checking the contrast of typography that's placed over an image or locating keyboard traps, um, we could imagine AI simulating the actual user navigation through the site um, capturing screenshots or video, and then having that be analyzed and replacing the human element. Um, another thing that's really interesting that's happening right now is Mozilla's Common Voice project. And so what they're aiming to do is enable organizations who aren't at the scale of Google or Amazon or Apple to start to develop their own speech interfaces through um, speech recognition and speech synthesis, and that this is a completely open source effort. Um, and so one thing that you can actually do today, even if you're not about to build a speech interface, um, you can go donate your voice at voice.mozilla.org. So I think that's pretty interesting. And finally, real-time remediation of issues. Um, in the future, the tools that we use to consume web content may actually be able to fix some of the mistakes um, made by a developer. Um, for example, if there's a disconnect between the underlying HTML of a page and the visual hierarchy, tools could be trained to identify these patterns and actually correct them in the HTML. And then also content simplification. Um, there's a lot of work being done right now, just kind of in a general sense around content simplification. But if we think about that moving in a, a bigger way onto the web um, and being able to you know, take text, maintain the original meaning and intent, but make it easier to understand, that could really benefit um, low literacy users, um, people who English is their second language, um, uh, people with cognitive disabilities or dyslexia. I mean, that could really have a big impact. So there's a lot of tech cool like stuff around the corner, um, like the real-time remediation, that would be great. But we're not there yet, so please don't wait for technology to catch up. Um, do what you can today. Uh, and I also talked a lot about the importance of a holistic view and cross-department collaboration. But I don't want that to stop you. Like, if you feel like you can't get executive support, um, you know, even the things that you can do within your own team, the things that you can do today to make your site more accessible are better than not doing anything. Um, so as promised on screen here, I've got a link to more resources at go.durabledigital.com slash A11Y. Um, that A11Y is kind of a common shorthand for accessibility. Um, you might see that elsewhere online. And feel free to reach out on Twitter. Um, I'm at Angela Wallach.